that we can come together and, Lord, we can hear the things that are happening in this country. Lord, open our eyes to see, but open our eyes even more to see what you're doing in this hour, Lord. Prepare our hearts to walk in the fullness which you've called us to walk in. Father, I ask tonight that you bless each person that comes forward to speak and that we hear the truth of what is happening in this country, Lord. And then, Lord, I ask that you give us wisdom to walk in the things which you've exposed to us. Lord, you said, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men freely without finding fault, and it will be given him. Give us wisdom this evening, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would everyone stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Yes. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This is our speaker. I'm going to ask Ken Bromit, who's just been so instrumental in everything that Miami has tried to do and support us financially and in every other way. So would you please welcome Ken Bromit to the stage. I know you all came here to listen to Terry Reed, but you know things are happening in this country and we need to do something. Uh, connect yourself in to what's really going on. Uh, there's a few things. There's a, there's a newsletter called the McIlvaney Intelligence. There's a free American newspaper that comes out. Both of these are monthly papers and they keep you in touch with what's going on in the country. There's also talk radio, which is now coming on strong. Uh, there's Jerry Hughes and Chuck Harder that are now on KDEF AM 1150. And they're on every evening uh, from about 8 o'clock to midnight. And you're just not going to get the truth in what's really happening in this country through the mainstream media. They're telling you that everything's going okay. The economy's okay. Uh, you know, the Oklahoma City bombing and stuff. You're just not going to get what's going on. And, uh, so, you know, just open your eyes a little bit, and I just wanted to let you know that these are some of the areas that you can tap in on, and it'll keep you kind of on keel with what's going on in this country, because things are getting serious. And now I'd like to bring up uh, Mr. Terry Reed, and of course, uh, anybody, uh, I'm sure that he's well known, and that's, uh, everybody knows who he is, and uh, with the MENA connection in Arkansas, and uh, I'll just bring him up. Terry? How does that sound? Okay. Uh, before we get started, uh, I was told to make an announcement that uh, Ann Gary uh, was nice enough to make uh, hundreds of copies of some news articles that haven't even been printed yet that I brought with me. And uh, so those are available for the, to be picked up on these side tables over here. Uh, but we have an advanced copy of the uh, the American Spectator that's, that's going to air this, that's going to be on the newsstand this Friday. And we've been talking about that uh, on Chuck Harder's show this week and whatnot, but uh, you're, you're welcome to go there and get copies. And Ann was nice enough to duplicate for us today. Uh, I'm not a public spokesperson. I, I still find it very awkward to, uh, to be coming forward publicly with, with uh, what was a very secret operation that I worked with. That loud enough? <laughs> That's good enough, yeah. I don't uh, profess to be a professional with this. I was uh, trained in the Air Force to be a briefing officer, but those kinds of briefings were to uh, small cadres of pilots, typically, before, just before a mission, and no one uh, graded you on stage presence. Because typically everybody was so scared they were wetting their pants or vomiting. 
maybe that's not the case here tonight. Uh, I'd like to introduce my wife, Janice, uh, who certainly is instrumental in letting me. She's, she's letting me do this, uh, because without her support and her, and her effort, and, and she works full time to help advance our cause, so without her I couldn't be trying to take this story public into federal court in, uh, in Little Rock, Arkansas this September. Um, also, I have three young sons sitting over there I'm extremely proud of, and uh, I'd like to... Duncan, would you please stand up there? That's my 12-year-old. <laughs> Elliot in the blue shirt there. And, uh, and Baxter with all the Hot Wheels when I got there. <laughs> but uh, I'm sure if... Uh, how many people in here listen to the Chuck Carter Network, People's Radio Network? Yeah, he's been really kind to me. Um, I met uh, Mr. Hart last last year. My book came out in the hardback in, in April of last year, and uh, shortly after it was uh, on the uh, newsstands, uh, the, it went through through talk radio. It, it went to the uh, number five position on the Los Angeles Times bestsellers list even though no one would review it. And uh, <laughs> Chuck noticed that and, and called me and said, uh, you've got the kind of book I like to talk about. It's, uh, it's a bestseller in California, yet you're being ignored by the, uh, the snobbish media that uh, is, whose job it is to review uh, books. So uh, I met him, and, and then, of course, he became a, a supporter of the, uh, of the Mena, Arkansas scandal. Uh, my, Jan my wife Janice and I drove to uh, Florida with a Chevy van full of documents. He wanted to see what we had before he agreed to uh, embrace us and, and uh, back us. So we spent uh, better part of a week in the famous Teleport Hotel in White Springs, Florida. And uh, after several days of he and his staff looking at our documentation, uh, material that we just quite frankly couldn't get in the book, there's just too much to discuss. And, uh, after he realized we were authentic, then he said, uh, that's great, let me get behind you. I, I, I really, I mean, he was very, very touched to see the, the effort we put into three years of trying to advance this, this case. Um, some of you may not know what I'm talking about, so let me sort of start from ground zero. Um, I, uh, I got involved in uh, Air Force Intelligence as a very young man. I'm a native of Missouri. I'm the eldest of six children. And uh, my father was a World War II vet. I saw action in uh, Africa and Italy. And uh, raised me to be a proud American and my brothers. And uh, some of you may boo this, but uh, my family were, were strong Truman supporters. Harry Truman was born uh, about uh, 21 miles from my hometown. So he was a local hero, and my great-grandfather was deeply involved in Missouri politics, so I, I was raised a, a Democrat. Uh, my wife, on the other hand, was raised to be a strong Republican. <coughs> so we're a perfect example of an interracial marriage. <laughs> it seems to work. But uh, uh, I went off to fight the Vietnam War. I was in ROTC before I uh, went into the Air Force. Uh, I, I was very, I felt very proud to be selected to go into intelligence. And um, shortly after working for about a year out of uh, my technical school program, we were told about uh, Defense Secretary Robert S. McNamara forming a, a, a unit called Task Force Alpha in Asia, that, whose job it was to uh, break the rules. We were told, quite frankly, that this, this unit was uh, going to be bending rules and, and trying to win the war. And that got me excited. And uh, so uh, I was very honored when I was picked to go to uh, and join up on Task Force Alpha. And uh, immediately, once we got to in, in place in Thailand, we realized we were working with the CIA. And uh, once we were fully briefed and saw what was going on, I was still wholeheartedly behind the program because uh, we were trying to do the things that Congress was prohibiting. Um, there's sort of a pattern here you can see developed in my life of getting uh, involved in sort of stretching the law as it pertains to uh, our foreign 
policy, especially during time of war. Uh, be that as it may, I served for two and a half years in Southeast Asia, um, worked in Air Force Intelligence for eight years, uh, became extremely disgruntled with the peacetime military, got out, uh, went to work in, uh, my father was in aerospace most of his life, and I went to work in uh, an industry that catered to the American defense industry, and that was the American machine tool industry for computerized machine tools, but it's what's called CNC and DNC manufacturing. And of course now we're up to 1980, and uh, I was in Oklahoma City working as a vice president of this small trading firm, Hungarian uh, owned, uh, my, my boss was a Hungarian emigre, and he had a lot of strong linkage to the FBI's counterintelligence division and the CIA since he'd been involved in, in nuclear programs. And uh, it was while doing that that, that uh, we happened to uh, take on a line of machine tools uh, manufactured in Japan called Toshiba, Toshiba Machine Tool Corporation. So I was sitting there trying to make my million dollars at the time I was 40 years old when, um, when we discovered that, that uh, there was some kind of an effort for the, uh, the Japanese technicians to get into American defense plants and steal our secrets. And um, we were already had a sort of a working relationship with a couple of FBI agents who were aware of, of uh, the KGB's efforts to do some of this, but they'd never seen Japan do it. And uh, so instantly I was, I was uh, enlisted um, into the FBI's counterintelligence division in Oklahoma City. Got to work with some pretty interesting people and, and got to uh, more or less be a spy. I was, I was liked by the Japanese. I'd known some of these men for several years and, and had been to Japan. I'd, of course, I'd lived in Asia several years, so I knew a lot of Asian customs and that allowed me the opportunity to, to uh, work within their organization without them suspicioning that I was monitoring what they were trying to do. And we, and we discovered that they, in fact, were stealing very sensitive American technology and selling it directly to the KGB. While I was doing that, I met uh, Oliver North. This is February of 1982 now. And uh, North was brought in. He was on the National Security Council at the time. Uh, he had a code name and CIA credentials as a cover, and we had other CIA agents we were working with. But uh, because of the sensitivity of what we were, we were developing, or what the, the intelligence we had developed because of the sensitivity, uh, I presume he was reporting this directly back to the president or vice president, I don't know, but it was, it was a high level, closed circle of people, I know that. So now we're up to the time frame of when uh, the, the man who I voted for, Ronald Reagan, decided to go against congressional will and, uh, and get involved in uh, supporting the Contras. Well, North and I worked together for about 18 months. I got to know him quite well and uh, knew about his political feelings. They paralleled mine, uh, our, our mutual disdain for a wishy-washy political system that played games with lives. And uh, so when I saw these atrocities in, in uh, Nicaragua, um, especially the abandonment of people who we had armed, guerrilla guerrilla efforts that we had created. Uh, I was told about a clandestine operation being set in place in a little rural town in Mena, Arkansas. Being from uh, southern Missouri, I knew where Mena was. Beautiful place, Washita National Mountains, um, isolated. Just beautiful country, right on the edge of Oklahoma, and uh, so I was told there was a man over there that if I had uh, if I had uh, wishing if I had wishes to get in, involved, um, all I had to do was nod, and he would seek me out, and um, so I said, okay, I'd like to meet this guy, and about uh, 60 days later, a man named Barry Seal came looking for me. Uh, I left out the fact that I'm a certified flight instructor with about 3,000 hours of flight time. In my last tour of duty in Asia, we we helped we helped heavily train the Nicaragua, uh, sorry, Laotian and Cambodian air crews on how to uh, drop supplies behind their enemy lines. 
And uh, lo and behold, that's just what the Nicaraguan nationals needed. They, uh, the CIA's intent was never to get a real shooting war started that would, that would involve using American troops. They wanted to get these guerrillas uh, up to speed so that they could fight their own war. And uh, sitting with Oliver North one day in a restaurant in Oklahoma City, he confided to me a, um, a plan that is now being called by historians the secret Reagan agenda. Uh, that, what that meant was, was uh, you know, the U.S. government had finally, to me it meant, we, we finally had a leader that wanted to totally dismantle the USSR. And, and Ronald Reagan wanted to do that in, in his lifetime. And, uh, and North told me about this, about, uh, you know, Glasnost is, a, is, is sort of a, a deceitful relationship. We're smiling and shaking hands on one hand. The other hand, we just as soon treat about 10 Vietnams to get them involved with in. And uh, you know, Angola and Afghanistan are sort of prime examples of all that. And uh, I thought that was a really unique idea, especially when, when it was told to me that uh, in final analysis, the uh, CIA, after studying the, the politics of the Vietnam War, had viewed it as, as a victory. And that, uh, that what we had learned uh, through our own mistakes was that the Russians were as stupid as we were. That they would uh, equally get involved in, in mindless, senseless exploits worldwide as they tried to prop up their, their colonization plan. You know, we called it the domino theory. The Russians called it the colonization plan, similar, similar to England setting colonies up around the world. So the idea was to, was to go back to Nicaragua and make, it, and make it a colony. That's what the USSR intended. Our intent was to get a rebellion in that country going so that the Soviets would have a heck of a time colonizing it, number one. But number two was to divert a lot of assets and energy into that country when they should be actually paying attention to their own infrastructure and building factories and automating and, and uh, working in their, in their agricultural departments to improve, to improve their productivity. So in a nutshell, that's why I got involved. Um, I thought it was the right thing to do at the time. I told Barry Seal I wanted to go on board as a, as a flight instructor. And uh, we set up a program, a training program at a little little air base called Nella. Now this all took place in late 83, early 84, and that's at a time when I don't imagine many people in this room ever heard the name of Bill Clinton. And uh, a very young governor, he was about 34 years old at the time, and, uh, when I first moved there. And uh, as he you know, sort of matured in his office, uh, we were all sitting over there doing our thing, and, and uh, I always felt from the very get-go that the state government of, of Arkansas was protecting our operation. Um, Barry Seal told us that, that we would not be bothered, that the FAA would not, not, would not bother me, I would not be ramp checked at the Little Rock Airport, I wasn't, um, that uh, we were operating in military training areas, uh, in, in airspace set aside for military training, that, and that the controllers that controlled that area knew we were there. And, and wouldn't bother us, and they didn't. We were told that the Arkansas State Police uh, would not be detaining us and asking us what we were doing, and they didn't. So it didn't take me too long to figure out that this had to be authorized at very high levels within the Arkansas State government. Um, Bill Clinton right now still does not want to accept that. And that's the problem. The, uh, the MENA story is... Uh, is a story of a lot of deceit. Uh, I think it was founded for all the right reasons, personally, but got out of control for all the wrong reasons, and that being greed and, and profiteering. Um, what Oliver North and the Reagan administration don't want to accept is that they started a covert operation. They enlisted civilians. They brought in uh, the over-the-hill gang, the older guys from Asia that uh, had been in semi-retirement since the Vietnam War. Uh, they brought in young guys like myself. I was, I was young then. <laughs> and, and had no gray hair. <laughs> but uh, 
But we all got together and set up our, our operation. And what they don't want to talk about is, is that something really bad happened, that this thing spun out of control, and that a drug operation got grafted onto our, uh, our operation. Uh, I mean, I'm here to tell you I've never been involved in the drug, drug business, and I never will be. But, uh, but I, some of us knew, some of, some of the group knew, obviously, and some didn't. I, I was in the group that didn't know. I, was, I had my hands full training Nicaraguan students. Uh, I was not flying the weapons flights. Uh, Barry Seal had provided to him a, uh, a C-123K military cargo airplane. That's, that's a pretty big airplane. Uh, a small C-130 would be a, a good comparison. And uh, he was flying the weapons uh, from staging areas in Arkansas down to staging areas in Nicaragua. And um, I did discuss in my book uh, that I knew that he was bringing in money. Certainly we all needed to be paid. And uh, he had a, a lot of overhead. He built a new facility at the Mena Airport that reminded me a lot of Air America's overhaul facility at Ludor, Thailand. Uh, you could get anything done at that facility that you wanted to have done to an airplane, literally, uh, with the exception of having parts sent out for heat treat. Uh, you could have uh, your jet engine overhaul. You could have uh, hot sections done, avionics installed, uh, major structural modifications. All of this done outside the scrutiny of the FAA which was only 200 miles away in Oklahoma City. So I felt that I was, I was working in, within the confines of a very authorized operation. In no time did I feel like this was just a, a rogue uh, drug, drug guy, Barry Seal, running around doing his thing. I mean, we had avionics technicians coming down from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Ohio, to work on our, on our airplanes and our avionics. So um, I'm just give me a little detail because there is certainly a, a spin coming out of the uh, Clinton administration right now that, uh, that whatever went on in MENA only involved Barry Seal and a bunch of drug traffickers, that this was had nothing to do with uh, an Air Force backed or military backed operation. But we intend to prove better or different in, in federal court. Um, if you've been hearing me on the radio programs here in, in Albuquerque, uh, my, my family and I are deeply embroiled in a, in a lawsuit. Um, I won't bore you with a lot of details right now, but we experienced, uh, we lived through what happens to people that become liabilities to, to important people. Uh, I, never, I never intended to write a book. I never intended to be here tonight. I never intended to be on talk shows. Uh, I had served my government quietly and intended to be in the shadows if they ever needed me, but. Uh, the moment I said no to the uh, drug trafficking operation, then I became uh, a liability. I became a person that they didn't want to deal with or work with, and uh, instantly I was, uh, I felt like a man without a country. As, as my wife and I tended to deal with that, that's what we kept saying is, we had no port, nowhere to run. We always felt we were Americans, this was our country. This is home. This is where you come when you're in time of trouble. <laughs> but as we lived in Positas in fear, we, you know, we felt, hey, we, we are a person literally without a country. We were we toyed at times with the idea of trying to go to Libya. <coughs> we were trying to figure out who would take us in, what enemy of the of the U.S. might give us sanctuary. And uh, interesting experience, in, interesting time frame. I don't ever want to live again, but uh, certainly opened my mind and changed my views about this thing that's behind our government. It's not the people we elect, but there's this, this thing, this machine out there that can, that can make bad things happen to people, or good things happen to people, if, if it likes you. So uh, with that said, um, sort of setting the stage, I'm not a public spokesperson, as you can tell, I brought some uh, video clips um, I think this story is so much better told through others. Uh, it's, a, it's a major, major story. Um, unfortunately, Albuquerque, like most of the country, is in a news vacuum when it comes to this story. You literally have to read the foreign news to see what's happening in this country. If you don't believe me, you should go to page one and read the, the London Telegraph. 
fact, I encourage all of you to start buying that newspaper and start reading what the foreigners are saying about us and read about the stories that, that our press tends to either discount, ignore, or attack. Um, and the foreign press seems to be the people that are advancing a lot of our scandal. Um, I've met and had the uh, almost honor to be working with a man named uh, Ambrose Evans Pritchard, who is a, a London uh, journalist who is on the cutting edge of, of not only this story, but uh, several others, one including uh, Vince Foster's death and his travels to uh, Switzerland and whatnot. And, and what does Ambrose get for his effort? He gets attacked by the American media, which, uh, which is an interesting phenomenon. Of, uh, it seems like in America they now attack the news organizations for reporting the news. Um, the, the Washington Post conducted a full-scale investigation when someone within their organization leaked uh, a fact about Vince Foster. I mean, the heads were rolling inside of that news organization, and, and, and Ambrose heard about it, and he said to me, I've never heard a newspaper firing people and sanctioning employees for, for reporting the news or leaking the news to the American public. But, uh, I, you probably heard me on the Do Ted Dawson show. Mr. Dawson, uh, you know, tends to defend the the media and uh, <laughs> says that uh, <laughs> says that there's no conspiracy here. And uh, uh, I don't say there's a conspiracy. I say there's a relationship. I, I agree with Chuck Carter's view that that big business has bought up the media organizations to the point we can't get the news any longer. If it, if it goes against their grain, if it fits into their scheme of propaganda and or uh, mind control for us, certainly we get double helpings of it. But if it, uh, if it doesn't, uh, it tends to make the, uh, the natives restless, they don't want us to, to know about that. But So what I've got here, is a compilation of uh, video clips that I'm going to play and I'll talk between them. They just sort of set a foundation and let you know that there's a whole sea of people involved in reporting on this story. Um, the, the MENA connection, the, uh, the videotape that, uh, that Chuck Harder and I co-produced, that's a two and a half, that's a two hour and 20 minute documentary, which is just full of, of some of the stuff I have here tonight. But, there are also uh, segments of uh, coverage that we couldn't get licensed uh, to uh, to use, but I can play some of this stuff. So, so I'll let you see some of the things that, that have been covered in the past about Nina, Arkansas, and, and, and implicates both political parties. And uh, you can also see what the foreign press, the British, and the um, and the Australians are are saying about us, and the kind of shows that are being spewed out around the world that, that we can't that we can't see and uh, that frightens me it reminds me of the iron curtain it reminds me of what i thought i was fighting against when i fought in the in the in my government and during the war i thought i was liberating countries that it seems like that we're turning into but with that said we'll start with uh, Start with a quote for those of you who haven't seen uh, the videotape, the Media Connection. We'll start with just a brief introduction here of Sarah McClendon. Uh, she's the senior White House news correspondent. I think everybody probably knows her. She's uh, in her 80s now. She just absolutely nailed Bill Clinton at, at a press conference uh, on Haiti uh, last October. And uh, it's interesting to see his response because when this is over, if we go full circle tonight, we'll end up with uh, the American Spectator story. And you can see what's coming out through others that were, that were it, you know, closely aligned to Clinton's inner circle uh, of the Arkansas State Police, the people that guarded him. And I think you'll come to the same conclusion that I have, and that his response here is a, is a barefaced lie. But let's start, start out with this one. Other journalists only dare to think. As she confronted William Jefferson Clinton about the Central Intelligence Agency's involvement in nefarious activities, activities set at a remote airport in western Arkansas while Clinton was Arkansas's commander-in-chief, 
she finally cornered the man who was a co-conspirator in bypassing the Constitution of the United States of America. In doing so, the president was not only forced to address the looming scandal that may impeach him, Clinton once again demonstrated his trademark talent. He lied. Sir, uh, the Republicans are trying to blame you for the existence of a small air base at Mena, Arkansas. This base was set up by George Bush and Oliver North and uh, the CIA to help the Iran Contras, and they brought in plane load after plane load of cocaine there for sale in the United States, and then they took the money and bought weapons and took them back to the Contras, all of which was illegal, as you know, under the Roland Act. But tell me, did they tell you that this had to be in existence because of national security? Well, let me answer the question. No, they didn't tell me anything about it. They didn't say anything to me about it. The airport in question and all the events in question were the subject of state and federal inquiries. It was pri primarily a, a matter for federal jurisdiction. The state really had next to nothing to do with it. The local prosecutor did conduct an investigation based on what was within the jurisdiction of state law. The rest of it was under jurisdiction of the United States attorneys who were appointed successively by previous administrations. We had nothing, zero, to do with it, and everybody who's ever looked into it knows that. Uh, a side story, I was working in a, in a uh, video lab in uh, Florida, and we had a copy of that uh, air freighted in from uh, McClendon News Network, which is Sarah McClendon's or own organization. And the guy that was editing tried to put some color back in Bill Clinton's face as the blood washed from his, from his body as a result of that question. And it was, it's fun to watch the whole interview, which is about uh, for that whole news conference. He never regained his composure throughout the rest of the conference. You could see it was haunting him. What had he said? Or had he said it right? It's, it's fun to see these guys when they don't have spin doctors around that can help them with their little canned comments. But uh, okay, so Bill Clinton is saying in there that he had nothing to do with it. That uh, yes, something went on. He, you, you notice he didn't deny that uh, the allegations that she set forth, he made no no uh, concerted denial. He just said, well, this, yeah, if this had gone on, certainly we had nothing to do with it, and yet we investigated. Now, that's a lie. Uh, Bill Clinton never investigated anything related to me in Arkansas. Uh, my wife and I have spent, I don't know, I'm afraid to ask her, how much money have we spent, Janice, uh, looking for this investigation that Bill Clinton claims his state conducted uh, in a total disarray in the Arkansas State Police Intelligence Center are 34 files, they call them, which they claim are the results of all their investigative effort. Uh, they're not cataloged, they're not collated, it's just garbage stuck in these files that, that you have to go sift through and, and, and look and see what kind of a case it was that the state of Arkansas was going to make. Uh, what I notice is what you really see is monitoring. You see numerous intelligence reports about Barry Seal, about his activities. You see allegations of all, all sorts of allegations coming forth, but you see no fine funnel of prosecution or a plan to prosecute or do anything with any of this. Um, i sure if we have any police officers or U.S. attorneys or district attorneys in the, in the audience, you, you know how a case is put together. You don't just swim in, in a sea of, of information without, without a clear stated goal of what you're after. Um, the Polk County prosecutor, Mina is in Polk County, which is a, is a rural uh, sparsely populated county on the western side. Uh, I don't know what the total population is, but it's a very, very impoverished county. And uh, Polk County Prosecutor Charles Black uh, had no money to conduct an investigation to deal with the CIA, or Barry Seal for that matter. Uh, he, they needed equipment, they needed surveillance equipment, they needed personnel, uh, they needed money for a grand jury. They didn't have, they, they knew that if they started an investigation that would result in a in a county prosecution, it would literally bankrupt the county. And Polk County <coughs> Prosecutor Charles Black went directly to Bill Clinton. Uh, he was a Clinton supporter. Went to Clinton and asked for money and said, here's what's going on. 
we want investigated is in our state. Uh, we've got all kinds of allegations here. We've got uh, other surveillance reports. Uh, we know the government has set up shop here. Will you help us investigate? And, and Bill Clinton did not do that. Uh, there's a big song and a dance about $25,000 that you may hear here in a moment, depending on uh, which tape I'm going to play next. You can see this is real organized. But um, the, the best coverage, in my opinion, so far to date, of American media coverage of this story was uh, done by CBS News. Um, a, a man uh, named Mike Singer, who is Dan Rather's producer, got onto this story, not as a result of looking for it. He was in uh, Arkansas, like most journalists, looking for whitewater dirt. And he started hearing about this media story, and someone told him to go down to the courthouse and look in a case file, which was the lawsuit that my wife and I filed in 1991. Because, I mean, this thing is a, probably as high as this podium by now. But in it was a lot of information relating to this investigation and our allegations of my involvement, of what, what had been going on, and what we saw as a reason on why uh, we had been singled out to be chased and hunted and persecuted and prosecuted. Uh, we, we were criminally indicted, and we fought for two and a half years to get rid of that stigma of, of being a potential felon. And uh, Singer digs into this file and calls me and says, uh, Terry, there's something here. I want to talk to you. I want to meet you and see what kind of a person you are. And I flew down, and, and he worked uh, for a better part of 10 days digging into uh, what he saw as, as a major, major cover-up. Um, the result of his work was in this eight-minute piece, which unfortunately most Americans didn't see. It, uh, strangely, it aired on a Friday night. Uh, Dan Rather did not, uh, was not the anchor person, the fill-in person did for some reason. And, uh, but I want to play you this next because it, it takes a lot of this information here and puts it in a very clear format for the rest of our discussion. Could you license that? Pardon? Was that one you could license? Yeah, but, but for the purpose of our videotape, yes. Reagan and President Bill Clinton, the subject of tonight's Eye on America. But first, a little background. In the early 80s, a war was underway for control of Nicaragua. On one side, the ruling Marxist regime, the Sandinistas. On the other side, rebel forces, the Contras, labeled by the Reagan administration as pro-democracy freedom fighters. A base of support for the Contra movement, remote western Arkansas. Correspondent Bill Plant has been investigating for tonight's Eye on America. 1983, Ronald Reagan was president Bill Clinton was governor, and little Nina, Arkansas, changed from a quiet town to a center for drug smuggling and reported Contra support activity. In the middle of it all, this man, admitted dope smuggler Barry Seal. He started doing business with the Ochoa family in Columbia, hauling his son, dope. Arkansas State Trooper Russell Welch investigated Seal's organization. Each trip would have uh, 250 to 350 pounds of cocaine. Uh, he stated that he made uh, a uh, million dollars in one trip alone. Seal built this hangar at Rich Mountain Aviation at the Mina Airport for his high-tech smuggling planes used to fly guns to the Contras and more than 20 tons of cocaine into the U.S. over three and a half years. Former IRS agent William Duncan traced some of Seal's drug profits laundered through Mina banks. We had direct testimony from people who were involved in the money laundering operation. We had testimony from people at banks who observed the transactions. And Barry Seal had another agenda. Pilot Terry Reed claims Seal hired him in 1983 to train Contra pilots at this remote airstrip north of Mina. I was involved in the flight training aspects of upgrading Nicaraguan uh, freedom fighters to make them uh, capable of flying combat aircraft. The airstrip was built by Seal's organization and also reportedly used to train Contra ground troops. In 1984, Seal was arrested for smuggling and was turned by the Drug Enforcement Administration into an informant and smuggler for the government. With help from both Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North and the CIA, Seal pulled off a spectacular drug sting. He flew his own C-123 to Nicaragua 
where he took these pictures of Sandinistas helping load Colombian cocaine onto his plane. After the sting, SEAL flew the C-123 to the Mina Airport, where it sat for a year. It was later shot down over Nicaragua, filled with guns for the conference. By late 1985, Agent Duncan had gathered substantial evidence of alleged money laundering against SEAL's associates Fred Hampton and Joe Evans of Rich Mountain Aviation. What happened when you tried to make this case before a grand jury? I was never asked to present the evidence to a grand jury, ever. The evidence was in this 24-count draft indictment prepared for the federal grand jury in January of 1986, but the grand jury never saw it. The United States Department of Justice did not pursue the cases, did not present the evidence of money laundering to the grand jury. Former U.S. Attorney Mike Fitzhugh, who handled the MENA cases, says that was because Agent Duncan asked for a delay. I consented to his request that, uh, uh, that the matter not be presented at the grand jury session meeting in January of 86. Agent Duncan says he made no such request. That is absolutely false. An FBI internal memo from early February 1986 obtained by CBS News says Fitzhugh was withholding presentation of the indictment, but there is no mention of a request from IRS agent Duncan for a delay. I would have been the last person in the world to have tried to delay evidence going to the grand jury. We asked attorney Fitzhugh if he was told to delay the indictment by the Reagan Justice Department. There was not any type of pressure or influence uh, put on, on me or anyone in my office that I'm aware of. For two more years, Trooper Welch watched as Fitzhugh's federal grand jury failed to return indictments in the MENA cases. It was a slow realization uh, over a period of time that no, uh, this isn't like any other case. Uh, it's not going anywhere. Uh, we're, uh, we're all wasting our time. By 1988, Trooper Welch and Agent Duncan had given up on the Reagan Justice Department, but not on their investigation. They had hopes that the state of Arkansas could impanel a grand jury to hear evidence of money laundering, drug smuggling, and conspiracy. They went directly to then-Governor Bill Clinton. That part of the story in a moment. <laughs> With more of our Eye on America investigation of drugs, guns, and money laundering in Arkansas in the 1980s. By 1988, law enforcement officials investigating the case had given up on the federal government, pinning their hopes for prosecution on the state judicial system. Correspondent Bill Plant picks up the story from there. By 1988, almost everyone in Arkansas had heard about MENA. It was here at Rich Mountain Aviation that authorities believed Barry Seal moved his operation. There were news reports about smuggling and Contra support activity around the MENA airport. Congress had begun an inquiry, and the media covered it all. At the Polk County Courthouse in MENA, Trooper Welch and Agent Duncan turned to County Prosecutor Charles Black for help. When it became apparent that uh, nothing was going to be done on the federal level, that's when I began more actively pursuing it. Prosecutor Black, a Clinton supporter, met with the governor and handed him a letter requesting money for a state grand jury on MENA. His response to me was that he would uh, uh, get a man, something to the effect that he would get a man on it and would get word back to me. And uh, I never heard back. Years later, Clinton said he offered $25,000 to Prosecutor Black's boss to fund a grand jury. But Charles Black and his boss claim they never heard about any offer of money from Governor Clinton. I believe Bill Clinton's an honest, respectable man, and I, I have to believe that he did that. But the fact is, I never got that word myself. But the MENA issue would not die. I don't think that the story of Iran-Contra has yet been fully told. In 1988, Arkansas Congressman Bill Alexander asked the General Accounting Office to investigate connections between the MENA airport, Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North's Contra operations, and Panamanian dictator Manuel Noriega. Alexander says the National Security Council, in this letter, <coughs> refused to cooperate, challenging GAO's authority and effectively killing the investigation. Then MENA became an issue in the 1990 Attorney General's race in Arkansas between Republican Asa Hutchinson and Democrat Winston Bryant. Sources tell CBS News that Governor Clinton's aide, Betsy Wright, asked Bryant to stay away from the MENA issue. Wright denies it. 
1991, Congressman Alexander got the Arkansas State Police a federal grant to reopen the MENA investigation. Sources tell CBS News that Governor Clinton's staff was involved in the discussions about what to do with that grant. The money went to State Police Chief Tommy Goodwin. That money was discussed around here for quite a while, <laughs> and, and we finally said, we'll just turn it back. We don't have anything to, to spend it on. So what happened to the state case? Nothing happened to the state case. A grand jury was never called. Uh, uh, it just it just died. I maintained uh, a certain amount of faith that at some point the problem would be solved. That never occurred. Has not occurred. Has not occurred to this day. Mary Seal's organization helped the Contras, smuggled tons of cocaine, and laundered drug profits through Arkansas. Why did the Reagan Justice Department fail to prosecute? Did Bill Clinton, then the governor, failed to provide leadership and support for a successful state prosecution. The White House says he did all he could. But Agent Duncan, Trooper Welch, Prosecutor Black, and a lot of other people are still looking for answers. In Washington, this is Bill Plant for Eye on America. ...for their work uh, on that story, for their efforts, um, Bill Plant was, and Mike Singer, um, well, I was with Mike Singer the day that we got back to Little Rock, and he said uh, he had to return a phone call. It was important that the president of CBS News had just called him. And he picked up the phone and called, and he was standing at a payphone at the Little Rock Airport, and he, he, he turned quite ashen, and he turned towards me, and he turned to Bill Plant, and he said, boy, that's the first time this has ever happened. And I said, what happened? And he said, uh, well, we'd just been over to Russellville, Arkansas, filming a company called Park on Meter, which you'll see here in a moment. Park on Meter is, a, is supposedly a parking meter manufacturer. In fact, we, we were at Santa Fe the other day and saw everybody has POM parking meters up there. But they also made gun parts for the Contras during the uh, prohibition of the, of the Bowen Amendment. And, uh, the company is owned by a very powerful man named Seth Ward. Seth Ward is the father-in-law of Webb Hubble. Webb Hubble was Bill Clinton's best friend. Uh, and Webb Hubble is, of course, now a uh, felon and going off to prison here shortly as a result of his uh, misde misdeeds in the uh, Rose Law Firm. But what had transpired was they were filming Park on Meter at the time they got back to Little Rock Dee Dee Myers had called the president of CBS News and was threatening to pull Bill Plant's press pass if they didn't quit working on this story. You know, and so, you know, when, when Ted Dawson says there's no conspiracy, um, that's not a conspiracy, that's a fact. That these people, you know, get in trouble for trying to, to effectively report, report the news if they go against the, uh, against the grain of the, of the Washington establishment, especially as they try to advance the story. But uh, that's one little side story. The other one is the fact that Bill Duncan, the man who you saw on the show there, the uh, IRS investigator, former IRS investigator, yeah. we have now thoroughly deposed him for our lawsuit. And he turned over to us 7,500 pages of money laundering evidence <laughs> that, uh, that he was not allowed to put on in that grand jury they're talking about, the contained one, the one that might fits you the U.S. attorney that scratched in the back of his head going, well, I don't remember, or I didn't call off anything. Well, that's a lie, too. So uh, uh, we've, we're the proud owners now of Mr. Duncan's grand jury material, which we're going to be putting on in our, in our trial in, in Little Rock this September. So uh, the point is, uh, this story is interesting. It's driven a lot of us together who, who wouldn't normally hang out together. I'm not, I'm not known to hang out with IRS investigators, but, uh, but Bill Duncan is certainly a guy that's paid a heck of a price for, for, what, for what he did. He's, be, he's to be commended. He was sent to MENA you know, by the number two man in the IRS uh, to investigate money laundering. Now, a real good way of containment of any intelligence operation, and you're trained in this intelligence school, is to investigate yourself. I was talking to an OSI member that was here, that's in here somewhere. And tell me if that's not a technique that's used in the Air Force. I mean, continuously, you, you investigate yourself. 
Now, what you do with your information is up to you. Whether you use that to prosecute or use it to cover up, then that's totally you know, at your discretion. So it appears what, what was going on was the federal government was, has been using different elements of itself to contain this investigation because a, a matter of fact is if there is a sitting grand jury in a federal district looking into a particular misdeed, that is the containment mechanism. Everything that goes on, whether it's state, county, or whatever, uh, any investigating material flows into that grand jury and is the property of that U.S. attorney. So uh, a real good way to, con to contain or con provide security for a covert operation is to start an investigation. If you think about it, every little county sheriff that's out getting intelligence on Joe Blow says, Joe, I saw uh, 10 uh, Contras jogging down the highway with M16s chanting Bolinus un Comunista, you know, or something like that, then that report would go to that grand jury. And if that, if that U.S. attorney doesn't indict, doesn't go forward, it, and, and he has no requirement to conduct the grand jury on any time scale. He can sit there and keep an open investigation on that operation or that allegation for as long as he so wishes. And uh, I feel that when we're through with this case, we'll prove that there were two U.S. attorneys and two grand juries that effectively contained it within the Justice Department, uh, both of whom would have been under Ed Meese, the, uh, the setting U.S. attorney at the time, attorney general for the uh, Reagan administration. Um, what I have here, Something that, that uh, we learned in uh, Air Force Intelligence School, that certainly I thought the application of my training at that time would be working in some little banana republic somewhere in the world and helping to overthrow some corrupt regime. But some of the things that I scanned from my manuals, we were trained in discussing uh, you know, how to neutralize a political party. That means if you go into back a party and you want to get rid of the other one, whether it's in power or not, maybe it's just a thorn in the side of the one that you're behind. If you get into um, how to neutralize that person's law enforcement, um, how to control their, their Department of Justice if that's what they have set up. And, uh, and there's a major heading, how to neutralize the media or to twist it to to report what you want. Now that can be done in a lot of ways. I mean, you, you saw this in Grenada. Uh, when we invaded Grenada, the very first thing we did was took over the TV stations and the radio stations and started broadcasting out what we wanted to do, uh, to say, to, to calm down the populace and let them know we weren't there to hurt them. We're here, here was our objective. Um, I'm, I'm telling you this because throughout the course of this, I've been using my own training to try to analyze how effective the containment has been in the MENA story and to see that this is right out of, C of CIA manual somewhere. The application of, of neutralizing the Justice Department, neutralizing law enforcement, controlling the grand jury process, and neutralizing the media. It sounds like a checklist that a general has as he takes over a, a foreign country. Um, it gets to be a little frightening to think about the application of this and. Um, in a story that affects now three setting U.S. presidents. I'm going to play you uh, right now. You might know Larry Nichols. <laughs> and Larry is sort of a fixture out there. Uh, Larry and I, uh, we do not conspire together, for those of you who may wonder. <laughs> um, we have different agendas. Uh, I have a, a federal lawsuit I'm trying to advance. I have a pretty narrow agenda, I think. Uh, my wife and I would like to uh, see some of those police officers that perjured themselves repeatedly in federal court in Wichita, Kansas. We would just love to see them strip of their power. I doubt if they'll ever go to jail, but that, that'd be interesting. Um, but, but beyond that, uh, I'm not particularly out trying to get Bill Clinton. Uh, Larry Nichols, on the other hand, has one stated goal, and that's to get rid of Bill Clinton. 
and, and his hatred goes back a long ways because he worked he worked in um, ADFA, Arkansas Development Finance Authority, and uh, the the circumstances surrounding uh, Larry Nichols' uh, dismissal at ADFA are really interesting. We have a covert operation that I worked in that was to support the Contras. Bill Clinton is a is a at that time was a a uh, outspoken opponent of our Nicaraguan policy. Larry Nichols was a state employee working in a very high level state job and a, a state audit was conducted. Um, the, you know, the bean counters came in to, to count things and they discovered these big phone bills, Larry Nichols' phone card, and found he was calling the Contras. That his, he'd been placing from his state phone many, many phone calls to Nicaragua and to Florida to talk to Adolfo and Claro, the, the chief contra. And uh, when uh, the auditors demanded to know what, what was going on, Larry said, I'm working on the contra project for Bill Clinton. And uh, Bill Clinton denied that and fired him promptly. And, and then started a, a, just a, what I saw was a pre-canned attack on Larry's credibility, he suffered immensely. I mean, he he couldn't get a job. Uh, if he got a job, he'd only have it a couple of weeks, and the Clintonistas would go out and make sure he got fired. And uh, so he hustled around from job to job for a couple of years, I guess it was, and finally, I, think, I believe he declared bankruptcy. It, it was a mess. So Larry's on the offensive now, trying to trying to uh, report about what what all he saw inside of ADFA. Uh, that becomes very crucial to our lawsuit because I saw a lot of the money that I think ended up in that but so our, our knowledge tends to, to dovetail but we don't hang out together and and, um, and as it's alleged uh, we conspire together to to be uh, Bill Clinton's chief uh, nemesis that's not my job but, but the reason I brought up Larry he's in this videotape this is something that most people haven't seen I found out uh, there was a show called Now It Can Be Told that, uh, that quite interestingly, got really onto this Mina story in 1992. But uh, the major news networks just wouldn't, wouldn't buy into it. And we'll get into that in a moment. Something major happened in April of 1992 that I'll be talking about in just a moment. But I think you'll enjoy this little segment here. The fact that I was counted upon as a man who got the job done. Five years ago, Oliver North told America he was a patriot. The country watched congressional hearings revealing that North's secret armies had shipped guns to the Contras. But what we never heard publicly were allegations that some members of the secret mission also shipped cocaine and heroin back to America. The MENA airport is out in the middle of nowhere, and we are told the CIA, FBI, DEA, Customs, and drug smugglers all like it that way. But now we are told that what has been going on here is about to break wide open, for not only is it linked to Governor Bill Clinton because Mina is in Arkansas, but because this story is also linked to President George Bush. It's possible we could wind up with a situation in this country where both the President, George Bush, and the Democratic nominee if he becomes the nominee, Bill Clinton, are both seriously involved and seriously compromised in illegal covert operations. Mark Swaney is a local graduate student who heads up a grassroots movement in Arkansas. He and others have been investigating what they claim is an illegal drug smuggling operation in their state under the guise of patriotism. Swaney's group wants a thorough state and federal investigation. They believe that Governor Clinton and President Bush know the secret of MENA and don't want the American public to know about it. It's a cover-up all the way from MENA, Arkansas to the White House. And it's serious. Anytime the government can run drugs, and, you know, and get away with it. Terry Capehart never expected to pick a fight with either Bill Clinton or George Bush. He is an airport technician who worked at the MENA airport and was the first person at MENA who discovered something mysterious was going on. I'd be out there at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning trying to catch gas thieves and got noticing weird, unusual goings and comings of airplanes. 
operation. Capehart told state police investigator Russell Welch what he had seen, but Welch wasn't surprised. He already had information that the infamous drug smuggler and gun runner Barry Seal was operating out of Mina. I didn't really want to get involved in the investigation, so I got my immediate supervisor and we went to Little Rock and uh, played out the, the scenario of Barry Seal and some of the local people who were working with him were already uh, saying that they were uh, working with CIA and, uh, and DEA, but they were, uh, they were shouting CIA mostly. We were several months in the investigation when federal, other federal officers told me that this case wasn't being handled the same as others. And that's when I uh, uh, took their word for it that something was a little bit different. Welch was not the only one who sensed this case was special. Others in Mina also realized that what started out as a simple investigation into Seal's cocaine smuggling business led to the startling realization that the government, for some reason, was protecting Seal. It's the same old story. They were, they were selling drugs to buy guns. The guns was legitimate. You know, they approved the gun selling. They just didn't approve the drug, bringing drugs back. How much cocaine was coming in? Barry said that uh, he brought in uh, 250, 350 pounds of cocaine each trip. Now it can be told has obtained documents which detail a CIA covert operation in MENA. More than 25 Central American pilots were trained at MENA. Details of the training operation were reported to Oliver North, codenamed John Cathy. Pilot trainers reported to drug smuggler Barry Seal. And this man, Richard Brinicky, also claims to have been a part of the Arkansas Contra operation. However, he says he was unaware of the drug smuggling. I went back and I started prying tops off boxes. Surprise, I found drugs. Well, not so little. Plastic bags with powdery substance inside it. And I, I have to tell you, I was totally shocked. Richard Brennicky has had brushes with the law before and has been called a liar in connection with other government scandals. When it comes to the Arkansas story, however, he says he is telling the truth. So I put the load on the ground and I called my boss, who happened to be Don Gregg. Worked in George Bush's office by now. And I said, Don, we've got a problem and we need to talk about it. And I told him what I found. You know what the answer was? It's none of your goddamn business. You were hired to drive an airplane. What are you doing looking in the boxes? If this is a serious thing, they ought to go to the proper authorities and have that matter investigated. The citizens of MENA did, but it hasn't been easy. Barry Seal was murdered, and Welch's investigation nearly cost him his life. What's happened to you? I really couldn't get into that. Were you ever poisoned? The, uh, I was sick, and it was, uh, uh, originally diagnosed as, as poisoning. Poisoning by anthrax? You know, military biological agent, great anthrax. We brought a letter that we'd like to deliver to Governor Clinton, but since he's not... Years of campaigning by the Arkansas committee never gained the full attention it demanded, so the committee held yet another press conference claiming Governor Bill Clinton refused to expose the scandal. A Clinton aide has told us that these accusations are junk, but all the evidence has been turned over to the Justice Department. Oliver North refused to be interviewed for this report, even though a man we met in Mina places North at the airstrip. He's Ernold Cunningham, an automobile dealer who says he gave Oliver North a ride from the airport into town. So when did you finally put it together that the guy you gave a ride yeah, to was Oliver three, North? four weeks later. Did you see him on television? Yeah, I seen him on television. And I'd heard it on television, but I just busy, wasn't paying no attention. And I'd seen his picture there one day. And it looks like the guy gave me a ride to the airport. Oliver North's face is a little hard to forget. Well, it was the short haircut, and his face features, and, and the way he stood. And have you ever told anybody this story and they thought you were pulling their leg? There, there was a point to where you didn't even talk about it because the local people tagged Russell, the state police, all of us as crazies. Well, are you? I'm not crazy. I know, but, you know, it was so big that people, people don't think that it can happen in Mena, Arkansas. That was what the problem. Chicago, yes, hey, if it had been Chicago, they'd have believed their word of it. Mena, Arkansas, no. It won't happen here. It can't. But it did.
So how much does Governor Bill Clinton know? Well, that's hard to tell since Clinton doesn't like commenting about this controversy. We do know that a local prosecutor claims that he approached Clinton asking him for assistance in the investigation. Clinton said he would get back to him, but never did. Then later, Clinton allegedly allocated $25,000 of state funds to look into Mina. If true, the prosecutor likened that to spitting on a forest fire. I found it hard to believe that a big drug operation or whatever was going on in Mina was going on right under the governor's nose, and he didn't know about it. And I believe if you open up Mina, you're going to open up a can of worms that, uh, that I don't want to be a part of. This is Larry Nichols. He was famous for 15 minutes when he produced Jennifer Flowers and the first big scandal of the Clinton campaign. Nichols and Clinton go back many years. He worked in the Arkansas Development Finance Authority, also known as ADFA. According to Nichols, he took a leave of absence to go to Central America to support the Contras. Did Clinton support your activities supporting the Contras? Sure he did. Sure he did. Did I sign out on leave to Tegucigalpa at ADFA? Yes, I did. Did my bosses at ADFA sign my leave and authorize me? Yes, they did. Nichols also claims Contra leader Adolfo Colero visited him in Arkansas. And to top that, the governor's office issued him an Arkansas traveler certificate, the state version of the key to the city. Nichols is now asking the FBI to investigate ADFA and a suspicious loan it made to a parking meter company. This was the very first loan ADFA granted, and it was made to a company called POM, located in Russellville, less than an hour away from Mina. POM, as I was told at ADFA, had a loan, and when I asked about that loan, I was told to shh, don't ask. Does the ADFA loan to park on meter raise any suspicions in your mind? On paper, there is nothing wrong with the, uh, with the loan. Um, it's, it's, it's a matter of the fact that we had interest in ADFA as a result of uh, uh, Mr. Larry Nichols is having been worked there and uh, his relationship to the Contras and ADFA's uh, creation by Mr. Clinton in 1985 at the very height of the uh, operations at MENA. To see whether POM was involved in any covert activities at MENA, we went in to speak with outraged President Skeeter Ward. While our hidden cameras were rolling, Ward pointed to his harmless parking meters and said that they were 99% of his business, but later acknowledged that they manufactured military parts that were used on the MX missile. Why is a parking meter company making military machinery? It is. It is odd, isn't it? He offered us a tour of the factory as proof that he is not involved in any wrongdoing. It was decided by various people in the military and in the government that the Contras might need an edge militarily in Nicaragua and that what they probably could do with would be some small guerrilla style uh, weapons that could use chemical uh, or even biological uh, agents. You say that is why Park on Meter is right next door to what? What is this facility? Well this is the 354th chemical division of the United States Army Reserves and they are a chemical war uh, outfit. To my mind, it means that there's, that there's enough coincidence here that uh, it warrants closely being looked at. It warrants investigation. I think that because of the politics involved that somebody briefed Clinton from higher up and told him, hey, this is a government operation, why don't you just kind of back off? Have you ever spoken to Governor Clinton about activities in MENA? About four weeks ago, maybe five. What did you say? What did he say? I told him that the media was going to investigate Mina. And he was going to get blamed for it. And they were trying to use me to do it. What did he tell you? That there wasn't anything there. I said, great. <laughs> one, of, one of us is wrong. One of us is lying. purchased my book. Uh, well, I also address this in, in the Mina Connection. Um, when I was a kid in, uh, in junior high, about junior high level, I, 
I got sort of hooked on, on Time Magazine, uh, especially on the, uh, in the section where people and people die, they get honorable mention. And, and I always wanted to be an inventor. And I thought, boy, someday I'd love to be mentioned when I die in Time Magazine. It was, it was a secret goal I, sh I didn't tell many people about. And, uh, well, I got my goal. I got a, a whole half page in Time Magazine, and I, I put the article in here because what we're going to get into now is the media and the, and the neutralization effort of the, of the MENA story, that the MENA, that the media uh, it w couldn't have been contained without an organization of the reputation and resources of Time Magazine. But uh, in a nutshell, so you know what happened, uh, where I told you my wife and I were acquitted in federal court in Wichita, Kansas. Um, we filed the civil action that's going to court this September. We filed it in July of 1991. Now, we, we came out of our criminal ordeal totally broke. Um, we'd, we'd lost everything. So we didn't have any money. And we had a lawyer in Arkansas who, who believed in the case and uh, took it on a contingency basis. But he was looking to us for us to have the funds to, uh, to investigate and, and, to, and to sustain us all during the trial. So Janice and I and the children moved out of New Mexico. We moved to uh, California. And, uh, and I got myself a job and just got overdosed with work and was trying to save as much money as we could. She likewise. And uh, we're turning the corner now into 1992. Now Bill Clinton's announced he's, he's a candidate. He's been defeated in the New Hampshire primary. Uh, Jackson Stevens uh, in Little Rock has loaned him a personal loan of like $4.3 million unsecured so he can continue his, uh, his campaign. And about that time, uh, my lawyer called, and who he told me and never talked to the media, so I was, and I was, I was avoiding the media. There were several people who had discovered our lawsuit saw that it, affect, it could affect Bill Clinton, and saw that it, it had named his chief of security, Raymond Buddy Young, as being a rather nefarious character. So lawyers were trying to find us, and they, quite frankly, couldn't locate us. So we were, we were, we were complying with our lawyer's wishes until that day he called and said, uh, Terry, I've been contacted by Time Magazine, and I really think that they're going to help us. And um, I want you to fly to Reno, Nevada immediately and we're going to have a secret meeting with a top reporter from Time Magazine. So I did. We went to a hotel room and uh, pulled the drapes and sat in a hotel room for the better part of the day discussing the foundation of my allegations and, and what I knew. This man's name is Richard Behar. Uh, Mr. Behar you know, professed to be my friend, wanted to help me, wanted to correct all the wrongs that had been done to me and my wife. Uh, he jumps on a plane with me. We fly back down to California where I was living. He spends the entire weekend digging through our documents to, you know, authenticate us. He leaves there with uh, 367 pages of documents and rushes back to Arkansas where he says he's going to investigate. Now, a key element of this story, I feel, centers around that company Park on Meter that you just saw in that video clip because that company is owned by Seth Ward. Uh, that, the, again, the, the Seth Ward Web Hubble connection has to be really thought about. Web Hubble married Seth Ward's daughter. Web Hubble worked in the office beside Hillary Clinton at the Rose Law Firm. I knew Web Hubble extremely well. I was a, at one time in business with Seth Ward. I'm not proud of that, but we were. And, um, so this connection of them getting this contract to build M16 parts is extremely critical to prove, to prove that, this, that this operation was being authorized from the high echelons of state government into a rather small <coughs> clique of, of friends and cronies that were getting these contracts, secret contracts. And uh, so Mr. Behar said he would target that element. He said, I want to go get on the gun stuff. You know, I'm not going to find any drug residue. This was his statement. I want to go get focused on the weapons manufacturing. And uh, so he, went, he ran off to uh, Little Rock, called me on nearly a daily basis, um, got 
in several almost fist fights with uh, prominent Arkansans who were in total denial, saying nothing went on, there was no MENA operation, this is a figment of Terry Reed's imagination and others who were just out to hurt Bill Clinton, which is absolutely ludicrous because I hadn't sued Bill Clinton. But that was the spin that was coming out of the Clinton administration. Um, Mr. Behar called me and attacked me on the telephone and said he had decided I was a liar and that um, unless I gave him all of my confidential court records, and because we had him at arm's length, I mean, we had a lawsuit, obviously, and he's a reporter, and my, my, my lawyer is authorizing us to give him some information, but some of our more critical stuff we're, we're saving for court. And so he turned into this, um, I, I compared to tr trying to feed a cheeseburger to a lion. It was a hand feed a cheeseburger to deal with Richard Behar. He was trying to swallow you up to your shoulder any given moment. But he made this threat over the phone, which my wife and I became upset about, and we thought, well, he won't do anything. This is just his way of trying to scoop the story to get all the information. Well, it, it was not a veiled threat. About uh, two weeks later, a full-page article came out in, in Time magazine entitled Anatomy of a Smear, which I've included in my book. And uh, in it, Mr. Behar professes that Bill Duncan and Russell Welch and all these people that you've seen in these tapes so far are just crazies and that nothing went on there. That I'm a certified liar. I never knew Barry Seal. I mean, this, this goes on and on and on. Uh, as a result of this article, ABC News will tell you they back totally off of the mean investigation. Um, NBC will tell you they back totally off of the mean investigation. All, all, most of the major networks were, in fact, starting investigations into who Bill Clinton was, where he come from, because he was becoming a very serious candidate for the president in, at that time frame, April 92 we're talking about. Um, the power that one organization has over the others is, is phenomenal. And I wouldn't have believed this had I, had I not been told directly by people whose names are in the, in the book, as I described it the media contacts that I knew were working on Mina, and they all just packed their bags and went home and said, well, if Time Magazine says it didn't happen, then by gosh, it just didn't happen. And uh, I've sued Time Magazine for libel over this article. Uh, resulted from our lawsuit, uh, we, we subpoenaed any and all records that the reporters had, and uh, we found out by, by accident in talking to another person that Mr. Behar tape records practically all of his interviews secretly. He, he wears a secret tape recorder. And so we took a stab in the dark and launched a subpoena for his secret tapes. And lo and behold, they coughed up a bunch. Um, some are very heavily edited, and we're still fighting over that. Some have missing segments, sort of like Richard Nixon's tapes. But the ones that we got were phenomenal. Uh, I, I included in the... Uh, the MENA connection, I included two soundtracks of some of those uh, tapes. I'm going to play you a segment here because it's really important. Now, this is Richard Behar, who's supposed to be investigating Park on Meter. He's supposed to be confirming my allegation that they had made gun parts there. Instead, you're going to hear him talking to Webb Hubble. Now, Webb Hubble, if you recall, was number three man in the Department of Justice a little later. This is about a year from the time. This would have been in April, March of 1992. So by March of 93, Mr. Hubble was in Washington with Janet Reno. So you're going to listen to what this guy is saying um, to Webb Hubble about not advancing the investigation into his father-in-law's company, but in containing the investigation. And I wish Ted Dawson. Is Ted Dawson here? OK, call him. Really? I, I would really hope he hears this part. I gave him a tape to play, but uh, and I told him I had the originals of these uh, of these uh, cassettes that, that I got the soundtrack off of to prove that these aren't manufactured. We have the, this is court material, and the originals are with my lawyer uh, in New York. But uh, I'll play this just a real short clip. The um, major media is what we're discussing while, we, while we're waiting for this. Uh, the segment to be located. Are we getting anywhere close to that? 
If not, I'll just skip on through to something else. Um, we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, the foreign press has been covering some uh, major stories that, as I said earlier, we haven't seen. Uh, in England, you have two uh, news networks. The, uh, the number two are the Avis. The Avis group is called ITN. And these are pretty old. I just think they're interesting and in, in to show, to let you see that that these stories have different spin on them outside of the, outside of our country. Uh, the, there's a, a company called uh, uh, what's Australian Broadcasting Network uh, that has been the most uh, professional, in my opinion, of covering white water and related topics in uh, Australia. There's a, a show called Four Corners, which is uh, it's an hours long program. It's like our 60 minutes. And I, it's, it's my understanding they've had three shows now. I only have a copy of one of them that they aired on, uh, on Whitewater. Unfortunately, we, won't, we don't have time tonight to play the whole show. And I'm not licensed to, uh, to make copies of it. But they, there, was, there was one segment that they did get into Mina. And they did get into a woman who um, I'm sure she and I have a a date with destiny here one of these days. Her name is Betsy Wright. Does anybody know who Miss Wright is? Yeah, she's... Uh, yeah, she's the one that did the job on the pinball right? Right. Now, Betsy Wright was uh, Bill Clinton's campaign manager in, Ar in Arkansas. She was his political brains. It's been, it's been said by a lot of uh, insiders that uh, you know, she has the guts to do what he won't do. And that means get down in the dirt and really get nasty. Uh, she... Uh, chaired all of his campaigns. Um, she's a close, close friend to Hillary. And um, she surfaces every time there's a problem. And the womanizing thing, she was the one on TV saying that was ridiculous. And I always wondered, how did Betsy Wright know what Bill Clinton was doing in his off time? But, but she was always vouching for him on the womanizing allegations. Uh, she, you saw her in that one video clip, talking. they were talking about uh, Bill Plant was discussing that it had been alleged that she was calling political opponents saying Mina would not be a topic during the last governor's race in, in Arkansas. Of course, she denies that. Uh, she is now the most, um, I, I was told by Sarah McClendon that she is the, mo the highest paid uh, uh, person in Washington outside of the White House that, uh, that bundles political favors into into uh, the Clinton administration. In other words, if you have something you want done, um, or if you want to bend the, the first lady's ear or Bill's ear, you you write a check for a hundred thousand dollars and take Betsy to lunch, and that uh, your your information or your problem will will get directly into the Clinton pipeline. So she's a, you know she's a, a political consultant is what she calls herself. Um, and she sits there now, uh, she will talk to the media. When Bill and Hillary refuse to talk, she's the one that, that will, that will give the, grant the interview and try to dispel the rumors and whatnot. So um, this one particular show on, uh, on uh, Australian broadcasting I thought was really interesting because uh, this was at a height of the Whitewater uh, investigation, the old one under, under Fisk, and uh, her comments are are very uh, interesting as if they pertain to uh, to me. To one side, questions of Bill Clinton's personal morality, there was something rotten in the state of Arkansas in the 1980s, something which Governor Clinton may have had limited knowledge of, but which during his tenure corrupted his state, undermined its law officers, and made a mockery of its judicial system. It's a story that goes back to Bill Clinton's attempt to fund industry through the state's bonding business. In the free-flowing financial climate, Little Rock bond traders flourished. One of the most successful was a flamboyant millionaire named Dan Lasseter. Lasseter's past relationship with Clinton could now be extremely damaging for the president. For Lasseter was a big campaign fundraiser until he was jailed on cocaine charges in 1986. Dan Lasseter had been uh, known in, in the area. I mean, it was no secret that he was big into cocaine, had wild, lavish parties with cocaine. And he was the 
person selling the original bonds at Advil. Dan Lester was a competitor. Uh, we didn't think he was a particularly good competitor. Um, and we didn't like the fact that he was interjected into a lot of, a lot of issues. Did you think there was a peculiar relationship between Lassiter and the Clintons? Well, I, I wouldn't say it was peculiar. I think it was obvious that, that they were friend, friendly. We felt like that was one of the main reasons they became involved as an underwriter because in a lot of, of these issues. Because, because they were Lassiter's friendly. relationship with Bill Clinton? Absolutely. He loved singing the hymns and, and the gospel music. And At the time, Bill Clinton's brother, Roger, himself a cocaine addict, was working for Lassiter. He was not close to the Clintons. He was uh, a supporter of the Clintons. I think he was close to uh, Clinton's brother uh, and probably knew his mother better than he knew Bill. Whatever the depth of the relationship, it's now the focus of FBI investigators working for the Fisk Inquiry into allegations about the president. If they drag their feet, we're going to be in the middle of, I think, July by the time this starts. If senior Republicans have their way, the Lassiter connection will be deeply probed at upcoming congressional hearings. Like Fisk's investigators, they're examining his role as a Clinton fundraiser, his connections to senior White House staff, and allegations only now surfacing that he was involved in a massive money laundering operation. We know that Republican investigators are talking to this man. For Dennis Patrick is carrying documents that might eventually uncover one of Arkansas's dirtiest secrets. So you've actually got your trade documents with you? Yes, I have the originals, as a matter of fact. Patrick is in hiding, so we brought him to meet us in Washington. There have been three attempts on his life that police know of. You can't ever live with the idea that, that it's ever over. He says his trading account was used by Lassiter and Company without his knowledge. It's very frightening to know uh, what may have happened to you. I mean, there's certainly a reason to kill a man for $100 million, or knowledge of $100 million. Dennis Patrick was a county clerk in Kentucky with assets worth less than $60,000. His story really begins in Florida sometime in 1985. An old friend, Steve Love, then working for Lassiter, took him on an all-expenses-paid fishing trip on a private yacht and made him a proposition. The way he explained to me is he, he knew how to trade the stocks and bonds uh, in, his, in an account uh, that would make me money. Did you have spare money to invest? No, I didn't have uh, spare money. He knew I didn't have spare money. Within days, Love called to summon Patrick to Little Rock he said he'd opened an account and made $20,000 for his friend, though Patrick hadn't put up a cent. He whined me. He, he, he essentially dated me. He convinced me. And, and I saw these things, and of course, I wanted them, just like any other person would want something. I would have taken rollerblades to Little Rock for $20-something You understand? So how did you meet Dan Lassiter? I think he was waiting for me. It, it appeared that he knew I was coming. He knew about your account? Yes. He was very uh, knowledgeable of the account. He was very familiar with it. Lassiter and company had started trading an account in his name. Patrick did get his $20,000, but it took him years to find out just how he'd been used. This is actually a picture of the, uh, of the individual who came to kill me, uh, this gentleman here. Patrick thinks his trouble started when he refused to sign over a power of attorney on the account. After there'd been several attempts on his life, he says, his old friend, Steve Love, gave him a package of the trading documents for the account. My wife has, uh, has asked me time and time again, why am I keeping these things? I don't even know what they are. And uh, I, I've explained to her, I don't know why I'm keeping them, but for some reason I did. They show that trades worth tens of millions were being made in his name. It's 11,700,000. And then there are um, a million, five million, four million, two million. So here's another one here for five million dollars. I mean, you were worth a lot of money in those days. <laughs> well, on paper, obviously yeah. someone was worth a lot of money. Yeah. It obviously wasn't me. 
This man says he knows at least one major source of black money flowing into Lassiter and company bond trades. In the mid-1980s, Terry Reed was a close associate of one of America's most prolific drug traffickers, Barry Seal. He says Seal and Lassiter were in business when he first met them. Lassiter introduced himself as uh, Barry Seal's investment banker at the time. Who else was there? Uh, Roger Clinton was uh, in the company of the two, of course. Uh, at that time, Roger worked for Dan, in fact, was his chauffeur. Roger Clinton, the president's brother. Yes, Roger Clinton, the president's brother, was Dan Lassiter's chauffeur. Reed says that Seal regularly passed on large sums of cash to Lassiter. What I observed, and from what Seal said, because he would typically arrive in town uh, with a briefcase that he professed to either contain cash or on, on a couple of occasions I actually did observe, did, did uh, have cash in them. And he would uh, be very security conscious uh, in taking his briefcase down to Lassiter's to have it uh, put on deposit. It seemed to be a very close-knit, secretive uh, operation. And I always presumed it was uh, a bond, bond buying. Despite his high profile, Barry Seal appeared to be immune to prosecution. He was flying regularly in and out of the country and had extensive facilities at the small airport in Mena, Western Arkansas. So at that time, you had the IRS, the Arkansas State Police, the local police, the FBI, Customs, and others all investigating or monitoring Barry Seal's activities. The state police records say that he moved into Mena in uh, 1982, and uh, he brought a fleet of planes with him, and he was hauling cocaine into this country by the ton, and uh, that's according to his own sworn testimony. This was a CIA or government-run operation, provided government cover. Uh, we were not uh, low profile ourselves. I based myself right out of this airport. In 1984, Terry Reid became involved in a covert operation run by the CIA in Arkansas. He says he trained Nicaraguan pilots as part of an effort to support the Contra rebels. He was brought in by a man he knew as John Cathy. Subsequently, I found out that John Cathy was actually a, a Marine Lieutenant Colonel named Oliver North. I sought approval of my superiors for every one of my actions, and it is well documented. At the time, Oliver North was working for the National Security Council and the CIA in secret operations to subvert the U.S. Congress, which had made it illegal to support the Contra rebels in their fight against the Nicaraguan government. Reed says it was North who recruited Barry Seal to run the trickiest part, the shipment of weapons to the Contras. Did you actually see weapons being air freighted out of the country? Yes, as I've seen uh, weapons being loaded into his aircraft, and I've even uh, observed weapons being assembled from component parts. I uh, probed a pilot that flew with Terry Reed and, know that, uh, and knows that he was involved in the uh, operation. In 1991, former Democrat Congressman Bill Alexander headed a joint investigation of the CIA's activities in MENA for the U.S. Congress and the Arkansas Attorney General. A number of the uh, C-130s were used during the 1980s uh, to transport uh, small arms and munitions from MENA to uh, support the war effort in Central America. And those same contract carriers uh, would be uh, used to bring drugs back to Arkansas uh, on their return flights. Reed claims he only found out about the cocaine smuggling later. But he did see the huge sums of cash generated by the operation and demonstrated the way in which, he says, drops were made on isolated properties. The purpose of this whole clandestine effort was to avoid detection by U.S. Customs as the uh, aircraft which had been to Nicaragua did not want to, uh, to have to declare its contents. Another of the CIA contract pilots gave testimony that he regularly flew weapons to Central America and returned with cocaine. He would open a cocaine uh, plastic bag. He would uh, 
put the powder in between his fingers, sniff it in his nose, taste it to it, make a positive identification of cocaine. He would estimate the value of that one uh, plane trip to be about $50 million. The hub of the operation was the MENA airport, a staging point for huge military aircraft, which the townspeople welcomed as a boost to their local economy. Uh, this would mean probably doubling the gross sales of the airport uh, in the, within the next two years. The CIA's operation generated money all right, but not the sort people expected. Money flows. Money laundering, a common occurrence, really to the point of being blatant, out in the open. An investigator for the Federal Internal Revenue Service, Bill Duncan, tried to follow the money trail. People on the street talking about it, people in the banks talking about it. A bank vice president walking down the teller line handing out stacks $10,000 to get cashier's checks for the SEAL associates. It seems to me that you're talking about an operation sanctioned by a high government agency, the CIA, to smuggle drugs into this country. There's no doubt in my mind that it, we have direct evidence that on order from the National Security Council, which was executed by the CIA, that drugs were smuggled into the United States for whatever purposes. Uh, and then those drugs have found their uh, their ways into the bloodstreams of children in, in the United States. Nobody was ever prosecuted. No one was ever indicted. And by that time, the risk was over. The risk that the Central so Intelligence Agency would be exposed, for example. Right. But you were put under tremendous pressure to prevent you from making these disclosures. Excruciating pressure. Drugs have a way of corrupting local officials, have a way of corrupting governments. Was it a corrupting influence in Arkansas? Yes, I think so. Uh, we don't know the extent of that corruption. Could that have gone as far as the governor's office? Well, one should not speculate without evidence uh, on, on where it could have gone. It could have gone anywhere. But uh, we don't know that until we discover the evidence. I don't know how he would have known it was a CIA operation, and governors don't get to tell the federal government what, what they do in secret operations. Terry Reid has now written a book about his role. In Compromised, he alleges Governor Clinton not only knew of the operation, but that his administration was paid to allow it to remain in Arkansas. He was very upset. He seemed to be very agitated at, uh, at the abrupt de departure of the whole operation and the residue it was leaving behind, I think, was, the, was his focus of, uh, of his anger. He claims he saw Governor Clinton at a meeting at Camp Robinson outside Little Rock when the operation was being wound down. The confrontation uh, was uh, diffused by uh, a promise that uh, the CIA would get actively involved in short-circuiting the judicial process. Not one person has corroborated Reed's account of the meeting. The story might be dismissed were it not for the fact that Reed's book is now on bestseller lists nationwide. So oh, false is to be laughable. I mean, this man's fantasy level probably qualifies him for some kind of institutionalization. I, I pass mentally ill people on the streets and wonder if it's Terry Reed. Uh, you know, I, this is pathetic, this person. It's been about uh, three months ago, through our subpoena effort, we were able to box in some troopers that, uh, that we felt had information to take away this, this thing of you know, Betsy Wright's allegations. You know, that everybody that ever alleges anything about Bill Clinton is, is crazy. It seems to be a pattern of, in her defense. Um, the uh, the word, uh, the word she uses quite frequently is pathological liar. Any, anybody that has something bad to say is a pathological liar. Uh, one of the troopers that we knew had evidence uh, that we needed is a man named L.D. Brown. And L.D. Brown is still a pretty young guy. I think he's in his early 40s. Uh, he was in his mid-20s when he went to work on Bill Clinton's security detail. His mother was... Uh, Chelsea's nanny at the governor's mansion. 
and uh, the mother had made a request for that her son wanted to go into local law and state law enforcement, and so the strings were pulled, and LD got a job as the youngest person on Clinton's security staff. And uh, we had a, an older trooper we deposed, a man named Larry Patterson, who's been in the news somewhat. And, and Larry uh, got us off, off the record and, and gave us a list of about four troopers that he knew, knew a lot about the MENA operation. So we have been slowly boxing Mr. Brown into the point where he was given an opportunity to go public, uh, and he did so. It's this story that I hope you all pick out a copy of that's going to be running this Friday in the, uh, Ar in the uh, American Spectator. It's called, it's called the Arkansas Drug Show. And uh, in it, L.D. Brown puts, uh, takes a lot of the Betsy Wright's allegations and just totally buries them because he puts Bill Clinton directly in the loop. In fact, he claims that he flew on two flights with Barry Seal and actually shuttled large quantities of cash from the Seal operation directly to Bill Clinton and gave it to directly to Bill Clinton's in the governor's mansion. And uh, and then when uh, this was 1984, which would have been right at the height of the uh, the operation as I knew it, and then he claims that. Uh, when he found out about the drugs too, that after he found out that one of the planes he was on had drugs in it, he complained uh, to Clinton as he was delivering the cash. And he says, uh, says meanwhile, I'm reading now, meanwhile Brown says he confronted Clinton asking him if he knew that Seal was dealing in drugs in unreported currency. Brown says Clinton told him not to worry. He said, according to Brown, quote, that's Lassiter's deal. That's Lassiter's deal, end quote. Um, there's also a law, and of course, so now in this story, Bill was wanting to say the drug side of it was going on, but it was his friend Lassiter, not, not him doing that. Um, there's a law called misprisonment of a felony, which you know anybody in this room can be charged. If you know of a crime and you don't report it, you can be charged with a light crime. It carries the same statute as and the same punishment as the crime itself. So uh, uh, we're, we're headed down to Arkansas uh, Monday to take uh, three troopers' depositions. And it, it appears at this point that Bill Clinton is at least guilty of misprisonment of a felony, which, which are felony charges. And uh, since we have a lawsuit that's uh, structured around, shall I say, a conspiracy, it, it, is, it does have conspiracy charges. But, uh, it, it, I mean, it stems from a conspiracy uh, statute. Uh, it doesn't matter how long ago this this occurred. It would be something that we get to bootstrap into the into the lawsuit this September. But uh, in it, in the story, of course, uh, Betsy Wright is quoted now as saying that uh, Mr. Brown is a pathological liar. <laughs> so you ought to take a chance to read this. We're we're really excited about it. We feel we finally have cracked into the. Uh, the, the inner circle of, of troopers that uh, that were obviously running protection for um, not only the Clinton administration but were even complicit in some of the SEAL operation. So I'm no longer alone standing here telling this story. <laughs> it's been a long, hard struggle, and I bet my government really regrets the day it sent me to intelligence school. <laughs> Um, we found that segment. I'm going to play this. I've got just one little short one, then we'll open up for questions, okay? Yeah. Um, and this is, I don't particularly want these guys to know that I'm on this story, but it seems to me they're acting a little irresponsibly. The Nation newspaper? Uh -huh. Apparently, I heard it through the grapevine, and they had an interview with Skeeter. Uh -huh. and, they be talking on that. and supposedly, Skeeter told them, that you guys have done exit cones on nuclear weapons. Okay, he, he wouldn't have said that. He knows better. Well, that's just the thing. Yeah. I don't know why it would come back to me to you know, as nuclear weapons. Yeah. Unless the story's taking a life of its own. Yeah. What you may want to do is give a ring to the nation. Yeah. And, and speak to whoever's doing the story and clear it up before they put it in their damn newspaper. Yeah. 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 But you didn't hear it from me. I really did. For Clinton, Arkansas, 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 Arkansas. Um, I, I think.
think it was a little less than a year. Um, he then went into, of course, a rehabilitation program, yeah. uh, which which included, uh, you know, I think, you know, starting a new investment firm and, and uh, <laughs> it's called the Phoenix Group, and he's now back in Rock uh, making more money. But there you see Time Magazine at their best. Um, that the Nation, we didn't get it started quite in the right place, but they're talking about the Nation Magazine, which ran about three articles, which I have in my book. Uh, about their investigative effort to get into weapons manufacturing. So you're seeing Mr. Behar, I've been talking to Skeeter. Now, Skeeter, that's the name of Seth Ward's only son, who is the plant manager at Park on Meter. So, uh, so Mr. Behar has made a real good friend there. He's, he's decided instead of investigating Webb Hubble, he's going to help Mr. Hubble run the rest of the media off uh, of the MENA story. I, I think that tape is just phenomenal that we ever have it. If the, and they're still holding back material they were trying to get from them. So if that's an example of what they think is the least damaging, <laughs> and I want to see what else they're, they're holding back. But my problems are really insignificant um, when compared to uh, Barry Seal. You know, Barry, uh, Barry Seal was a man that, uh, that I think got a really raw deal from, the, from his grave. I mean, he was... Uh, He's been demonized. Um, what people have uh, have accused him of all kinds of things. He can't defend himself. He's dead. His uh, his widow lives down in Baton Rouge. Uh, just recently, my wife and I have have uh, been talking to her by phone. Uh, resultant from my book, uh, I've sort of resurrected Seal's credibility a little bit, and finally, uh, her children, his children, Barry's kids, can now openly admit who their father was uh, because he was just, you know, what was piled on him no one deserves considering that uh, Barry Seal was the single most important witness ever developed by the DEA. I mean, I've got letters to that effect. I've got a letter from the Attorney General of Louisiana to that effect. Uh, Barry Seal's testimony, per first-hand testimony, could have, been, could have convicted the entire Medellin cartel. He could have... Uh, indicted uh, Papa Escobar, Ochoa, Carlos Later, I mean, you name it, he had been to their plantations in Colombia and flown cocaine directly out of their airstrips. Um, so while, while Barry Seal was, uh, was waiting to testify in a, in a major drug trial, um, a U.S. attorney, I'm sorry, a federal judge named uh, Frank Palazzola down in Louisiana uh, decided to uh, um, renege on an agree, a plea agreement that Barry had made with the U.S. Attorney's Office over in Florida. And uh, he basically had the, the language is you worked your sentence off. He was supposed to be a free man. He'd gone back to Louisiana. He was immediately arrested in that federal district. And the judge there, Judge Palazzola, uh, said, I don't care what you've done for your government. I don't care how important a witness you are. Um, your, your agreement with the uh, federal district in Florida says that you're on probation. So a condition of your probation is I'm sentencing you to a Salvation Army halfway house. That uh, you have to be there from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. seven days a week. That uh, we want to keep an eye on you. That you cannot carry a weapon. That you're, you're, you cannot have bodyguards. and. Uh, so they stripped him of his ability to protect himself. And uh, they also said, the judge also said, uh, or the U.S., the, his, Barry Seal's lawyer, as well as the lawyer for the government in Florida, jumped up in federal court, I have copies of these transcripts, jumped up and said, uh, you cannot do this to Mr. Seal. He has cooperated with the government. He's now a government agent. He's, he's instrumental in these lawsuits, to these indictments that are coming up. And besides, we know that there's a contract on his head, that the Medellin cartel has put a contract, it was 1.5 million dead, 9 million alive, which means uh, they wanted to have some fun with, with Barry that, back then in Columbia. But uh, like I say, my problems are nothing compared to what his problems ultimately were. But this is what I feared when we lived in Placitas. I thought, as I was indicted, 
the federal, my federal judge said, uh, asked me if I was a firearms enthusiast. And I said, uh, yes, sir. He said, do you have any guns? And I said, yes, I do. He said, you cannot have them. And no, nor can anyone in your family have a gun in the home. You cannot be near firearms. You can't be in anybody's house who has guns. And I find this quite interesting. And you're not a convict. You're just, you've been indicted. You're waiting to have your trial. But yet that's how you're treated instantly as you're a hardcore criminal. And I had no records of, record of conviction. But what had happened to Barry Seal is what I feared. And uh, I think it's best captured here in this tape. <laughs> and uh, obviously Mr. Seal didn't testify and uh, obviously um, he didn't write a book and he didn't talk about Mina. But if anybody could have talked about the story with a lot better knowledge than me, it was Barry Seal. So uh, anyway, that's all. I guess he couldn't talk about Bush either. Yes, he could have. Barry Seal was the man that told me on the way back to Panama that the DEA had tapes of uh, two of the Bush kids being snared in a drug sting operation, and I thoroughly believe that to this day. There's a, uh, your, your organization ought to try to get a hold of, a, of an FBI agent uh, named Darlene Novinger, who is a female agent that uh, had to leave the FBI because she had developed the same information while working undercover in Florida. And that information was that two of the Bush children had, had been ensnared in a drug trafficking operation. The DEA had taped it, and that copies of the tapes had been, had been you know, copied and had been uh, slipped out of the evidence labs, and certain people had them, and Barry Seal professed to have a copy of it when, uh, when I was with him in December of 85. Yes. Sir, where do you where do you see your uh, effort headed, and what kind of results could eventuate, and what kind of timetable do you see? Well, this is an old lawsuit. We have um, you know we have um, been out there for four years. We filed it in July of 1991. It's slated to go to court uh, September of this year, and uh, as I said, I, I wrote a story. For Chuck Harder's uh, Chuck Harder's newspaper, he asked me to write a. He gets so many phone calls and faxes about what is this lawsuit about. He asked me to write something a couple of months ago, or a month about a month ago, and I did so. And I've got there's a copy of that over there to, to be picked up. But I, I tried to succinctly as possible describe the lawsuit and describe our our agenda and also to describe why we've been successful to this date. And, and there's been a lot of strategy here about how to file this so it doesn't get knocked down. And uh, it's a civil rights case. And it's not about drug trafficking, and it's not about Bill Clinton, but yet it is. And that's what I talk about in this, in this newsletter here. Um, we have a date in court with uh, Raymond Buddy Young, Bill Clinton's former chief of security, Tommy Baker, a former trooper, Don Sanders, a current trooper, and then we structured it where we get to add defendants as we go, because it's a conspiracy. We've, we've alleged a conspiracy among these people. So you get, we, had, we had these uh, sleeping defendants like David Doe and Robert Rowe and unnamed others. So as we get more information, we get to put them on there. Um, what that means is um, we get to get into motive. The, the case is three-tiered the way, it, the way it's designed. Uh, the core of it we can prove right now, and that's that we were set up. We have enough evidence right now to, 
we had enough evidence a year ago to do that. But we decided to delay it uh, last September and, and re restructure it so that we could get into motive, which is what I always wanted to do, but I quite frankly thought it was in, would be impossible that there were too many powerful people to fight. So, uh, but we saw Watergate, I'm sorry, Whitewater, we saw Whitewater opening up uh, a lot of uh, opportunity. So we, we restructured it. So motive, we could develop the motive aspects. I mean, why did these guys do what they did? When Raymond Young got out of bed in 1987 and decided to attack me and my wife, why did he do that? And we now know he worked for only one man, that was Bill Clinton, took no orders from anybody else. We now have sworn testimony from other troopers that I was set up. They know when it happened, how it occurred. They know what Young did. He was the mechanic of it. So now we're going into the next tier of saying, why was I such an extreme liability? They would resort to, to using the criminal justice system as a way to track me, if nothing else, just to hunt me down and, and incarcerate me. And I imagine, hope that I would end up like, like SEAL did. But uh, they, that didn't happen. And so here we are. Yes. Oh, sure. I mean, that. Uh, Repeat the question, please. Her, her question is about the trauma on our children. And uh, the, the, the main reason I wrote a book, I wasn't writing a book. No. What I was doing, things could get so distorted in federal court when you start filtering it through lawyers. I mean, you've seen this in the OJ trial. You know, one side can produce you know, heinous information, the other side produces opposite information. If you don't moderate it with your own comments, who knows what really went on. So I thought, I told my wife uh, that we needed to start writing a lot to leave behind something for our children so that they'd know from our words what had gone on. So my, I have a son, he wants to go to the Air Force Academy. He wants to fly jets. He probably never will be given that opportunity because of my criminal history, even though I'm not a criminal, I was indicted. That's a big smear on your record. And, uh, and I felt I owed it to him an explanation of what I did, what my motives were. So we, we were doing our, our notes, really, which turned out to be almost like chapters, and that ultimately became our book, really. And uh, trauma-wise, I think they're stronger than I ever was. I think, uh, especially my oldest, who has good memories of all this, um, he's a very political kind of person. He has a, a, a far expanded mind than I did when I was 12 years old. So for every positive, there's a negative. Who's, uh, who's the federal judge, and uh, have you done any background checks on him? Yeah, we have. Uh, his name is George Howard. Um, he's the same man who sentenced Webb Hubble, which uh, that's a good sign. That's a good sign. Yeah. Uh, he's also he's a Democrat. Obviously, he was appointed by. Uh, yeah, you know, but obviously there are no Republicans in Arkansas. Well, they, there are, but they still wear pointy hats and meeting caves. You know? uh, but uh, that, that's a joke. But the uh, the uh, George Howard has so far been very, very fair to us. He was appointed by LBJ. Um, he's a pro-constitutional judge, and we have a constitutional case. So, as far as Arkansas judges, we we, we drew the best one we could. Good happen. Yes. Thank you, for Terry, Terry, for being uh, such endurance uh, all day on the last two days, uh, I guess, uh, on the radio, book shows, for helping us to get the truth out of New Mexico.